Defending Your Castle, page one. A cast of bad actors. How far would you go to protect yourself, your family, and your stuff? Most likely, your answer is something along the lines of, well, as far as I have to. It's always been this way, since the first Neanderthal cave dweller bared access to his abode by pushing a large rock in front of the entrance. There are two kinds of people in the world, those who have stuff and those who want to take other people's stuff. This book describes methods, machines, and mechanisms for defending your home, your castle, from all sorts of bad actors. City defending your home, your castle, from all sorts of bad actors. City sackers, pillaging pirates, bad guys, trespassers, brigades, hajuks, thugs, decoits, and every other organized, semi-organized, or anarch, anarch, what? Anarchic band of evildoers seeking to bring mayhem and destruction to peaceful law abiding people like you. After reading this book's title, you could be thinking that the projects and advice contained in this book are perhaps eight centuries out of date. Well, maybe they are. Certainly, the world is at least a Page two, bit more civilized now than it once was, and the threat of marauding hordes banging down your doors have lessened over time, but, and this is a big but, it has not gone away. Although we are currently experiencing the longest sustained peace between the largest and most powerful countries in history, things could always go haywire and in a hurry. If that happens, few things will be as important as knowing how to mount a powerful and well-considered defense of your home and property. Protecting your castle is now and always has been a vitally important skill set. There have been assaults on homes, villages, towns, and cities since the dawn of human civilization. Perhaps the earliest recorded siege is the destruction of of the walled city of Jericho by Joshua and the Israelites in about 1350 BCE. Joshua's technique included blowing trumpets and marching around the walls while holding the Ark of the Covenant. Apparently this worked because the walls reads the Bible did fall, allowing the Israelites to sweep into the city. The only Jerichoanian to survive was a single woman to whom Joshua owed a debt of gratitude. Such violence was all too common in ancient times. For example, diagrams and Hieroglyphics on tomb walls in Egypt recount an ancient siege of the Hatiti city of Dapur by King Ramses II in the 13th century BCE. Using scaling ladders, bows and arrows, and other implements of warfare, particular to the earliest known wars, the Egyptian invaders were able to breach the walls and conquer the poor Hatidis. <laughs> I don't know how to say it. Causing them to exclaim, 
We were crushed under your sandals, and your might has penetrated our land. Yes, but you still may say that was then, and this is now. I have no need to provide for my own defense. Why I can call the police, or if worse comes to worst, the army will protect me. Perhaps you are correct, but again, perhaps not. On the night of April 24th, 1184 BCE, the citizens of Troy slept soundly, feeling confident that their army and leaders would protect them from the Greek adventurers who stood outside the city walls. But at night, Athenian soldiers crawled out of the Trojan horse, a large hollow statue that the city's leaders had stupidly brought inside the city walls. Unaware of what and who were sitting silently inside. The spies opened the gates to the invaders, and by morning, Troy had fallen. In every century, groups, countries, and tribes of people have invaded other groups. Such invasions have been as dependable and as consistent as death and taxes. In defending your castle, ideas for protecting your homestead, school, or workplace against threats of many types are provided. There are two main themes to the book. The first covers projects and concepts related to real material threats to your well-being. The concepts, ideas, and thinking processes detailed are suitable for use in a wide range of situations that I hope you never experience. The second theme is more imaginative and probably a bit more fun. In attempts to answer a theoretical yet still important question, to wit, if you were attacked by a fierce wild horde of Mongols Vikings, Huns, Macedonians, or similar group, how could you protect yourself? It is, to me at least, and since you bought this book, probably to you as well, an interesting question. To answer it, we'll delve into the history of these people and explore their tactics with an eye to staying out of trouble. This section is a combination of science, hands-on do-it-yourself technology, history, and a special type of history called counterfactualism that seeks to explore what-if scenarios of, your, of our past. And there's a picture of the Trojan horse. The Precision of the Trojan Horse into Troy by Giovanni Domen Domenico Tiepolo, National Gallery in London. That was page three. Page four. The first counterfactual do-it-yourself book ever. One of the oldest and yet most popular tropes in fiction is that of alternative history stories. Basically, such stories are based on speculation about what the world would be like if instead of X happening, Y had happened. For example, how would the world be different if the Confederacy had won at Gettysburg? If Ottomans conquered Vienna in 1683, or if the divine wind had not blown Mongol invaders away from Japan's seacoast in 1281. The earliest example of alternative history fiction 
I have found comes from the Roman writer Livy. His book Ab Urbi Condita The City of Rome Since It Was Founded was written just after 9 BCE and is a monumental work covering the history of Rome from its legendary founding by Romulus and Remus in 753 BCE to the death of Emperor Nero. For the most part, it is similar in form and tone to most classical Roman history works. Dense with dates and names, there are lots of accounts of the accomplishments, the city's leaders, and piles of impenetrable detail about heavy infantry, battle tactics, and cavalry charges. While history scholars may find it an interesting work and certainly important, most readers would find it a dull slog indeed. There's little in it that's novel or terribly griping. That is, until one reaches the ninth book in the series. For in book 9, paragraph 17, Livy does something no one had done before. He changes history, figuratively and literally. After describing another in a long line of battles and sieges, Livy departs from his factual but dry retelling of the second Semenite War and makes a sudden left turn into Historiography's Hall of Fame. A writer goes counterfactual for what is likely the first time in written history. I digress more than is necessary from the order of the narrative or by embellishing my work with a variety of topics to afford pleasant resting places as it were for my readers page five a mental relaxation for myself the mention however of so great a king and commander as Alexander the Great induces me to lay before my readers some reflections which I have often made when I have proposed to myself the question, what would have been the results for Rome if she had been engaged in war with Alexander? How different indeed would the world 400 years after Alexander's army marched have looked to Livy. Quite a lot, apparently. Livy wrote that he was certain that had Alexander marched west to Rome instead of east to Persia, Rome's legions would have triumphed over the Macedonians. Alexander's huge influence on the world, including the Hellenization of European culture, the rise of the Levantine Ptolemaic kings and the chastening of Persian influence in the Mediterranean would not have occurred. The world surmises Livy would be a completely different place. 
Perhaps he's right, or perhaps he's not, but that's besides the point. Livy's sudden and novel What If digression adds spark and interest to the page and makes his book one for the ages. New counterfactual genres. Given a few facts and making use of the knowledge of human nature, all manner of thought provoking alternative histories can be written. Since Livy's initial foray into counterfactual history writing, thousands if not millions of authors and thinkers have asked and speculatively answered similar questions. The popularity of such postulations is obvious now. They are clever techniques for probing the relative importance of a historical person or event. For the most part, this is the stuff of novels and history textbooks. But more recently, counterfactualism is seen in modern types of media. Counterfactual and alternative history movies are popular. Page 6. And frequently successful. From Back to the Future to Planet of the Apes to Groundhog Day. Counterfactualism is a popular fictive technique. As you may expect, the internet is filled with this as well. One well-known counterfactual meme kicked around the internet asks, Could a single U.S. military battalion with its modern firepower, communications, and training defeat the entire Roman army? The question itself is interesting and easily lent itself to all sorts of juicy counterfactual analysis. So much so that the idea became the basis for websites, books, endless comments on websites, and even a cable television show. Defending Your Castle explores the premise of a similar alternative history question. Given modern knowledge of construction techniques and materials, could you successfully defend your home, your castle, from a horde of Hun, Viking, or Mongolian invaders? The stories, histories, and projects that follow explore a variety of ideas for adding security to your castle. The word castle being a catch-all phrase to describe your house, your camp, your neighborhood, your school, or any place of refuge. If you've paged through this book a bit already, you have likely noticed some very off-the-wall projects. For example, building a moat around your suburban home or adding observation towers to your backyard are provided as food for counter historical thought unless you're really distrustful of your neighbors on the other hand some projects are quite practical depending on your needs and desires take a look at recent newspaper headlines and i think you'll Agree there are many people who just might benefit from a Kevlar backpack or hidden book safe. Many of the projects reside in a gray area, straddling the not so well defined border between useful, interesting, and fanciful. Page 7. A cast of bad actors. 1.2. 
shows a well situated castle. Fresco by Andrea Mantegia in the Pla Palazzo Ducale di Mantova, Italy. Defending your castle, let's conduct a thought experiment. Take a moment and imagine looking out your front window and spotting a horde of men in front of your house, apartment, dormitory, or campsite. This group, a large, dirty, and noisy one, behaves in a manner that leaves little doubt that it is up to no good. A closer... Page 8. Look through binoculars. Reveals the men are not particularly well equipped. The situation is confusing, worrisome, and a little baffling. In this situation, as in most alternative history stories, the question of how this came to be doesn't really matter. Perhaps these people are remnants of a post-nuclear war apocalyptic society or they are the poor mutated remnants of a people scourged by a terrible infectious disease or maybe they are scared and confused mongols accidentally caught in a time warp and transported to the present time and place why they are here doesn't matter. What does matter is how you now choose to handle this situation. The projects and historical vinarets in the chapters that follow are designed to provide the information and techniques you need to defend your castle and turn away modern day thugs, brutes, hooligans, and other contemporary threats. Ahead, you may find many projects, each carefully designed and researched. There are my raid ways to accomplish an end, though, and there may be better methods and techniques for moat building or catapult construction than are provided here. What is here will go far to get you started. Not just in defending your home, but also in learning to build interesting things and developing a new appreciation of history and science. Genghis Khan, Alexander the Great, and Attila were all famous leaders who amassed giant empires. Theirs are household names, but although hardly known today, there were some defensive geniuses who stood up to and turned these invaders away. Flavius Aetius was a Roman general who sent the Hun army running at the Battle of the Chalons. Count Odo of Paris, who we'll meet in a later chapter, commanded a mere 200 men but successfully fought off a vastly larger Viking attack on Paris in 885. Even the Mongols, the most fearsome and successful of all of history's invaders, were once turned back by a now nearly forgotten Korean general named Paxo. But mostly it's the aggressors, not the defenders, whose names are remembered. In the pages that follow, we'll look at the lives and times of some of history's most successful invading hordes, as well as those who defended against them, and in so doing, learn how to construct defensive strategies to protect our own castles. 
our cast of characters. Alexander of Macedon left his homeland in northern Greece with a large and well-disciplined army in 332 BCE. He marched east out of Trace and raced through the Levant, Asia Minor, into Persia and beyond to India. Not once was Alexander's army defeated in battle. The Mongol leader Genghis Khan was no less successful. His warriors captured a portion of the world even greater than that amassed by Alexander. From Eastern Europe to China, no person in history of the planet commanded as great an area in terms of square miles or percentage of the world's population. Following in the footsteps of the Mongol Khans was Timur, or as he is better known, Tamerlane. He is remembered today as a brutal and predacious conqueror, unrivaled by any other in his cruelty to those he fought and defeated. The monuments he built to commemorate his successes were like those the ancient pharaohs, giant pyramids, but unlike the brick pyramids of Cheops and Joser, Dozer, Tamerlane's pyramids were constructed of human skulls. Western Europe in the Middle Ages couldn't catch a break. Apart from the periodic waves of aggression from its east, perpetrated by one or another group of Central Asian horsemen, it was equally threatened by seafaring raiders from the north. The Danes or Vikings, as they were usually called during their lifetimes, launched attack after attack on cities, towns, and hamlets in Ireland, England, France, Germany, and Spain. The Vikings were excellent sailors skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat and clever enough to choose easily accessible and poorly defended waterside targets. The effectiveness of these tactics earned the Vikings a formidable reputation as raiders and pirates. In the 12th and 13th centuries came irregular waves of Christian invaders moving eastward through Eastern Europe toward Jerusalem. These were the Crusaders. While in some cases the Crusaders were chivalrous and valiant, in many other cases they were a sorry lot indeed. The bad ones, and there were many, possessed a rare type of cruelty bred from generations of crushing poverty, ignorance, and superstition. Far too many of the ill-armed, unsophisticated, and page 10 unchivalrous crusader Warriors partially compensated for their lack of sophistication with an intense enthusiasm for rapine and plunder. Of all the great invaders, least is known about the first great barbarian intruder into Europe. Attila was the king of the Huns a now little-known group of nomadic Eurasian invaders who came out of 
the steps to threaten and in some cases crumble the ruling powers of Western Europe. Like the Macedonians of Alexander before and Mongols of Genghis after them, the Huns rarely lost a battle. But unlike Alexander and Genghis, once gone, Attila left little to remind the world of his presence. We'll meet each of these worrisome groups, plus a few more, in hopes that understanding their history, armaments, and motivations will help prepare us for our own future battles. 1.3. Most modern homes like this typical suburban dwelling are totally unprepared for defense against attack from an invader. Page 11. General Safety Guidelines. Before you get started, there are some important things you need to know. Number one, the projects described here run the gamut from simple to complex. Note that the person, <coughs> the purpose of many of the projects is to build a device that hurls, shoots, or throws something. Projects should be, should always be supervised by adults. Number two, read the entire project description carefully before beginning the construction process. Make sure you understand what the project is about and what you are trying to accomplish. If something is unclear, reread the, the directions until you fully comprehend it. Number three, some of the projects call for the use of hand or power tools. Use tools according to manufacturer recommendations. Number four, use care when operating, installing, aiming, and firing these projects. Seek professional guidance when necessary. Use tools, materials, and other gear in strict accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. Number five, Use extreme care when using, building, or moving heavy objects. Number six, wear protective eyewear, gloves, and other safety equipment when appropriate. Number seven, individual projects may also have their own specific safety instructions. The instructions and information are provided without any promise or guarantee of safety. Each project has been tested in a variety of conditions, but variations, mistakes, and unforeseen circumstances can and do occur. Therefore, all projects and experiments are performed at your own risk. If you don't agree with this, then put the book down. It is not for you. <laughs>